Hello everyone and welcome to Edupedia World. Today we are going to continue with our unit 1 of chapter 2 that is residential status and scope of total income. In today's class we will be discussing some more examples and illustrations on the determination of residential status of an SSC. We will see two more examples so that the concept of determination of residential status becomes very very clear in our minds and there is no scope of any confusion regarding that and further we'll discuss the residential status of HUFs, AOP, BOIs and companies and then we'll be done with our unit 1 of chapter 2 that is residential status and scope of total income. So let's start today's session. We are done with almost all the learning objectives of this unit number one number two number three we have done all the three and now we just need to revise all these learning objectives by uh, just taking few more examples and further the residential status of SSCs other than individuals that is HUFs AOP BOIs and companies so the learning objectives of this unit are almost done and today there's just a revision of what we have done in previous classes. Now let us take one more example on the determination of residential status of an SSC. What is the question saying? Mr. C, a Japanese citizen, left India after a stay of 10 years on 1st of June 2012. So, the first statement of the question is saying that Mr. C, who was in India for 10 years, left India on 1st June 2012. Okay. Now, during the financial year 1314, he comes to India for 46 days. So, in the year 1314, he is coming to India for just 46 days. Later, he returns to India for one year on 10-10-2014. In the year 1314, he came for 46 days and then again left. Now, again on 10th of October 2014, he is coming to India for one year. So, in the year 1415, that is the financial year of 1415, he is in India from 10th of October to 31st March. In the year 1415, he was in India from October to March. Now, we have to determine his residential status for the assessment year 1516. So, for the assessment year 1516, the previous year will be 1415. So, we have to see all the conditions given with respect to the previous year 1415. So, now we have just all the information given in the question and now in the next slide we will see the solution. Now, what does the solution says? During the previous year 1415, since we have been asked to determine the residential status for the assessment year 1516, we have to see all the conditions determining the residential status for the previous year 1415. So, when we see that, we see that Mr. C was in India for 173 days in the year 1415. And how is that calculated? He came to India on 10-10-2014, that is 10th of October. So, including that day, that is 10th of October, we get 22 days of October, 30 days of November, 31 of December, 31 of January, 28 because that was not a leap year of February, and 31 days of March. So, total 173 days he was in India in the previous year 1415. And his stay in the last four years is, it is given the question that he came to India for just 46 days in the year 1314. So, for 1314, 46 days. And then in the year 1213, he was in India for 62 days because he left India in the year 2012 on 1st of June. So, for the year 1213, he was in India for 
30 days of April, 31 days of May and 1 day of June. So total 62 days in the previous year 12-13 he was in India. And then in 11-12 and 10-11 for whole year he was in India since he left India after 10 years on 1-6-2012. So the, for these two years he was all the year for the full year he was in India only. So when we calculate the number of days for which he stayed in India in the last four years preceding the previous year we get the total of 838 days that is 46 days of 1314, 62 days of 1213, 365, 365 respectively of 11, 12 and 10, 11. So we can say that Mr. C is a resident since his stay in the previous year was 173 days and in the last four years was more than 365 days. So we all know the conditions. What were the conditions given to be a resident in India? Number one was the SSE has to be in India during the previous year for a total period of 182 days or more. So this first condition was not being satisfied by Mr. C since he was in India in the previous year for just 173 days. So we moved on to the second condition and tried to see whether he falls under the second condition. And what was the second condition? He has been in India during the four years immediately preceding the previous year for a total period of 365 days or more and has been in India for at least 60 days in the previous year. So, Mr. C satisfied the second condition as he was in India in the previous year for 173 days that is more than 60 days and in the four years immediately preceding the previous year he was in India for a total period of 838 days which is more than 365 days. So, since he satisfied the condition 2 of section 61 so he is a resident though he did not satisfy condition 1 but he did satisfy condition 2 and it is given under section 6 1 that the SSC has to satisfy any one of those two conditions so if any of those two conditions is satisfied he will be regarded as a resident so Mr. C satisfying the second condition will be regarded as the resident of India so now when he has been Regarded as a resident, we further have to see that whether he is resident and ordinarily resident or resident but not ordinarily resident. So, what were the condition for being resident and ordinarily resident? The condition was he is a resident in any two out of last ten preceding years preceding the relevant previous year. So, he has to be a resident for 2 out of 10 years preceding the relevant previous year. And here the AND condition was there that is he has to satisfy both these conditions in order to be regarded as resident and ordinarily resident. And the second condition was his total stay in India in the last 7 years preceding the relevant previous year is 730 days or more. So now we have to see whether Mr. C is satisfying both these conditions or not. If he is satisfying, then he will be regarded as resident and ordinarily resident. And if he is unable to satisfy any of these two conditions, then he will be regarded as resident but not ordinarily resident. So now we see. We see that his stay in the last 7 years is more than 730 days. It is obvious from the above calculation because in the last four years only his total days of stay came, came to 838 days. So it is evident from the above calculation that his stay in the last seven years was more than 730 days. So one condition is satisfied and second condition that is he has to be a resident in two out of 10 years preceding the relevant previous year. So since he was in India for 10 years prior to the year 2012 so he was resident in at least two out of ten last years preceding the relevant pre previous year it is obvious that 
he was resident in two out of last 10 years because he was in India for continuously 10 years till 2012. So this second condition is also being satisfied. Therefore, Mr. C is resident and ordinarily resident for the assessment year 15-16. Now, after doing the residential status of individuals, now we'll move on to the determination of residential status of HUFs. When we did the residential status of individuals, the conditions regarding the resident and non-resident or resident and ordinarily resident or resident or not ordinarily resident were wholly and solely dependent upon the number of days of stay in India. But in determining the residential status of HUFs, the main condition to be satisfied by any HUF to be regarded as a resident in India is that the control and management of its affairs is situated wholly or partly in India. So, if any HUF is considered a resident in India, then its control and management should be in India, whether wholly or partly. And if the control and management is wholly outside India, then it would be regarded as a non-resident. So, let us see what is given here. A HUF would be resident in India if the control and management of its affairs is situated wholly or partly in India. If the control and management of the affairs is situated wholly outside India, it would become a non-resident. So, now, what do we mean by the expression control and management? This is a very subjective term. So, how can we determine whether the control and management of any HUF is in India or outside India. So the IT Act has given some points which will help us in determining whether the control and management is in India or outside India. The expression control and management referred to under section 6 refers to the central control and management and not to the carrying on of day-to-day -day business by servants, employees or agents. So, it is given in the IT Act that the expression control and management means the central control and management. What do we mean by central control and management? Central control and management means the decision-making process from where is the business being controlled, where are the policy makers and decision takers sitting and from where the major decisions affecting the working of the HUF is being taken. If that is being taken in India, it is resident. And if the major policy and decision making is done outside India, then it is a non-resident. So it is clearly given that the carrying on of day-to-day -day business activities of the HUFs by the servants, employees or agent will not be regarded as control and management of the HUF. If the day-to-day -day business is being carrying on in India, but the major decisions and policies are being taken outside India, then that will be, that HUF will be a non-resident. Though the day-to-day -day business activities are being carried in India, but the major control and management is outside India. So therefore, the HUF will be regarded as a non-resident. So it is given that the business may be done from outside India and yet its control and management may be wholly within India. So it can be the other way also that the day-to-day -day business activities are being carried on outside India but the major control and management is being there in India. So in that case, the HUF will be regarded as a resident in India. So therefore, control and management of a business is said to be situated at a place where the head and brain of the adventure is situated. So the head and brain means the place where the major decisions affecting the working of the HUF is being taken, that will be regarded as a place where the control and management of the business is situated. The place of control may be different from the usual place of running the business and sometimes even the registered office of the SSE. 
so it may happen that the registered office of the SSC that is the HUF is situated in India but that also does not mean that the HUF can be considered as a resident because if the major control and management and the head and brain of the HUF is not at the registered office of the SSC then the HUF will not be regarded as a resident though the registered office is in India but the major decisions and policies are being taken and implemented at some place outside India. So in that case, the HUF will be regarded as a non-resident. So this is because the control and management of a business need not necessarily be done from the place of business or from the registered office of the SEC. But control and management do imply the functioning of the controlling and directing power at a particular place with some degree of permanence. So it is clearly given that it may happen that all the functioning and day-to-day -day business are in India, but the major decisions and policies and the heads and brains of the business is outside India. So in that case, the HUF will be regarded as a non-resident. After determining whether HUF is resident and non-resident, we further determine whether the HUF is resident and ordinarily resident or resident but not ordinarily resident. In determining whether HUF is resident or non-resident, the major condition was the control and management of the affairs of the business of the HUF. But in determining the, that if the HUF is resident and ordinarily resident or resident but not ordinarily resident, we, we check whether the karta is resident or ordinarily resident or the karta is resident but not ordinarily resident. So, the residential status of the karta that is the head of the Hindu undivided family determines whether the HUF is resident and ordinarily resident or resident but not ordinarily resident. So, if the karta is resident and ordinarily resident then the HUF is resident and ordinarily resident. And if the Karta is resident but not ordinarily resident, then the HUF is also resident but not ordinarily resident. So we can just say that in determining whether HUF is resident or non-resident, we have to see the control and management of the affairs of the business. If it is in India, then it is a resident. If it is outside India, then it is a non-resident. And after determining that, we have to further see whether HUF is R and OR or R but NOR. In order to determine that, we have to see the residential status of the Karta. Now let us take one example to understand the residential status of HUFs in a more better way. What is the question saying? The business of a HUF is transacted from Australia and all the policy decisions are taken there. So please just pay attention to this first line of the question. It is saying that all the policy decisions are taken in Australia. Now, Mr. E, the Karta of the HUF who was born in Kolkata, visits India during the previous year 2014-15 after 15 years. He comes to India on 1-4-2014 and leaves for Australia on 1-12-2014. Determine the residential status of Mr. E and the HUF for assessment year 2015-16. So the question is saying that first of all we have to determine the residential status of Mr. E and after that the residential status of HUF. So let us start to solve this question. First of all, we determine the residential status of Mr. E and the residential status of Mr. E will also help us in determining the residential status of HUF because we have learned in the previous slide that in order to determine whether the HUF is ordinarily resident or not ordinarily resident, we have to determine whether the karta of the HUF is ordinarily resident or not ordinarily resident. So let us first of all determine the residential status of Mr. E. So during the previous year 
Mr. E stayed in India for 245 days. And how that 245 days is calculated? It is from 1-4-2014 to 1-12-2014, meaning from 1st April to 1st December. 30 days of April, 31 days of May, 30 days of June, 31 days of July and August respectively. Then September, October, November and the one day of December. The total of these all days come up to 245 days. So Mr. E stayed in India for 245 days in the previous year 1415. So he is a resident or not? Obviously he is a resident because we have learned that in order to be a resident of India an individual has to satisfy any of the two conditions given under section 6.1 and what are the two conditions? The first condition was he has been in India during the previous year for the total period of 182 days or more. Since Mr. E was in India in the previous year for a period of 245 days which is obviously more than the period of 182 days therefore Mr. E can be regarded as a resident of India. Now we have to determine whether Mr. E is ordinarily resident or not ordinarily resident. So what were the conditions for ordinarily resident and not ordinarily resident? The conditions were that an individual is said to be resident and ordinarily resident if he satisfies both the conditions given under section 6. And what were the two conditions that ne needed to be satisfied? For being called an ordinarily resident they were number one he is a resident in any two out of the last ten years preceding the relevant previous year and his total stay in India in the last seven years preceding the relevant previous year is 730 days or more so these were the two conditions which needed to be satisfied in order to be called as an ordinarily resident but since Mr. E has returned to India after 15 long years, he does not satisfy any of the two conditions given for ordinarily resident. Thus, Mr. E will be regarded as a resident but not ordinarily resident. Now we come to the residential status of the HUF. What was the condition? For determining whether HUF is resident or non-resident, it was that the control and management of the affairs of the HUF is situated wholly or partly in India. But it is given in the question that the, all the policy decisions of the HUF were taken in Australia. So we can conclude that the control and management of the HUF was in Australia. So. Since the business of the HUF is transacted from Australia and nothing is mentioned regarding its control and management. But we can say that since the policy decisions are taken there, the control and management was also in Australia. So since the control and management was fully outside India, the HUF will be regarded as a non-resident in the previous year 1415. Since it has been regarded as a non-resident. The further determination of ordinary and not ordinarily resident does not arise. So we have determined the residential status of E as not ordinarily resident and of the HUF as a non-resident. Next we come to the residential status of firms and association of persons that is AOP. In this case also, the condition that determines whether the AOP or the firm is a resident or a non-resident is the control and management of its affairs. If the control and management of its affairs is situated wholly or partly in India, then the firm or the AOP will be regarded as a resident in India. And if the control and management of the affairs is situated wholly outside India, then the firm or the AOP would be a non-resident. So the condition is same as HUF that is the control and management of its affairs. 
Lastly, we come to the residential status of companies. How to determine the residential status of companies? A company is said to be a resident in India if number one, it is an Indian company as defined under section 226 of the IT Act or number two, its control and management is situated wholly in India during the accounting year. So in order to be a resident company in India, a company is required to be either an Indian company as defined under section 226 of the act or if it is not an Indian company then if its control and management is situated wholly in India then it is regarded as a resident company. So we can conclude that every Indian company is resident in India irrespective of the fact whether the control and management of its affairs is exercised from India or outside. So in case of Indian companies, it doesn't matter whether the control and management is in India or outside. It has to be a resident company. But if a company is not an Indian company, then we have to see whether its control and management is in India or not. If it is in India, it is a resident company. And if it is outside India, then it is a non-resident company. In case of companies, the control and management of affairs of the company are said to be exercised from the place where the directors meetings and not the shareholders meetings are held, decisions taken and directions issued. So in case of a company, we have to see that if the directors meetings are being held in India or not and the major decisions are being taken in India or not. If these are happening in India, then only we can say that the control and management of the affairs of the company is in India. In case of Indian companies, we don't have to look forward for this control and management condition. But in case of not Indian companies, that is companies which are not Indian companies under section 226, we have to see whether the control and management is India is in India or not. And for that, we have to see that where the director's meetings are being held. If the director's meetings are being held in India and the decisions are being taken in India, we can say that the control and management is in India. And if the case is opposite and vice versa, we will say that the control and management is not in India. And hence, the company is a non-resident company. Thank you, students. So now we are done with the topic of residential status of various assesses. In the next session, we'll continue with the scope of total income.